Um, you know, I got, I got caught in a series without even realizing it. I've told you before, I don't generally like to do series on stuff because I like to be free to move, and if the Holy Spirit uh, speaks something to me, I like to be able to preach on it. Well, he's been speaking to me, and I've noticed over the last several weeks it's all been on the kingdom, which is really appropriate because everything is about the kingdom of God. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, um, and so it's just, it's just been really refreshing because I'm free to just, I'm free to go wherever it is the Holy Spirit leads me, but it's, he has been directing it in this kingdom mindset. And, and I just love that because that's what we are about. We're about the kingdom of God. Um, we want to see the kingdom of God come on this earth. We want to see the kingdom of God come and change the culture. We talked about it last week. We have to shift the atmosphere to change the culture, and uh, we had several sermons on how uh, biblical figures cha- shifted the atmosphere and then changed the culture, and we saw amazing things happen. The church growing from from 120 people to 5,000 people to you know who knows how many uh, today, and so um, it's just an amazing thing uh, when the Holy Spirit leads us some way. And we're, we're going there, and we don't even realize sometimes uh, he's taken us on a trail. <laughs> and uh, so we're on this kingdom trail. And uh, this morning, I just want to talk to you about something that I've been thinking a lot about lately. And um, the, the, the sermon today is entitled, Corporate Prayer Produces Kingdom Culture. And so I know a lot of you know this, but, um, you know, it just it looks really weird when you walk in. And there's all these pews, sorry. There's all these pews. I keep forgetting we record now. And then there's this circle up here, and the circle's always empty. Do you know why that circle's always empty? Is because that's the corporate prayer circle for Wednesday nights. Okay, I'm going back. <laughs> sorry. So, um, so that's, where we, that's where we meet together on Wednesday nights and when we do our corporate prayer. We've been doing that for how many years? Many, many years. Five or six years it's been meeting with corporate prayer there on Wednesday nights at six. And so um, <clears throat> this isn't a shameless plug for the prayer meeting, but it's a shameless plug for the prayer meeting. And the reason that I'm, I'm talking about corporate prayer today is there's a huge difference between corporate prayer and personal prayer. And I don't know that a lot of people understand that. And so I just want to read some scripture to you today. And uh, we're just going to talk about the purpose of corporate prayer and what it's supposed to do, why we do it the way that we do it, and what we believe it's producing um, in the region of the Quad Cities. And so, Father, this morning, I just pray that you would help us uh, to uh, get rid of all of our agendas, get rid of all of our preconceived notions about uh, what we're going to talk about today. Help us just to hear from your Holy Spirit as we uh, dive into the subject and as we seek to know your heart and the truth on corporate prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there's a scripture in Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 12, and it says this. It says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. And so um, the, the, the key phrase here is that these all, with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's noteworthy to just stop and talk about that a little bit. That, that word continually is a Greek word, uh, proskarteo, and it means to attend constantly and interactively with. So continually means 
to attend constantly. So whatever it is you're doing, you're attending it constantly and you're, attend and you're doing it interactively with those around you. So when we're talking about corporate prayer, corporate prayer requires participation. It requires uh, interaction. It requires us to have one mind. In John 17, Jesus uh, prays this prayer for the apostles, the disciples that are there with them, and then he begins to pray for the people that will come to believe through them. That's you and me. And his whole prayer is that not only the, dis, the, the apostles would be one as Jesus and the Father are one, but then that those who will believe through them will be one, just as the Father and I are one. And uh, I talk a lot about oneness. I don't talk a whole lot about unity because there's a big difference between oneness and unity. Oneness is where we come together with one mind, one heart, one job to do, and we do it without arguing, without slapping each other around. I'm pausing and saying, nope, I'm not going to... I'm not going to go that direction. <laughs> but we, we do, the things that we do in the church in oneness means that we have, we have one mind, and that is what? That is to do God's will. And the oneness that comes in the body of Christ is because we are continually just searching for God's will, and then we come together and we do God's will as one people. That's oneness. Unity is when a bunch of people get together and do the same thing. Those are two completely different things. In Genesis chapter 11, uh, people began to build a tower because they said, let us reach into the heavens. Let's, let's build a tower up to the heavens and we'll, we'll just go see what this God thing is all about. And uh, <clears throat> they were trying to, they unified to do something, but it was against the will of God. And so, you see, you can have unity and not be in the will of God, but you can't have oneness and not be in the will of God. Does that make sense? I just think it's important you understand that because when these uh, apostles and, and the women came together, they were of one mind. They were in oneness. You know what kind of car the apostles drove it was a Honda because they were all in one accord I've been waiting to use that joke for a long time and it wasn't as funny as I thought it would be but anyway um, the, the Bible continually talks about the apostles especially during this first portion of the book of Acts they were in one accord they were of the same heart and mind you know they were continually praying in one mind. That's what corporate prayer does. So there's a difference between private prayer and corporate prayer. Our private prayer closet, uh, that's for building ourselves up. Our private prayer closet is where we take care of our personal needs. It's where we talk to the Lord about our own transformation process. It's where we talk to the Lord about um, Aunt Bessie's infected toenail, things like that. It's where we talk about the things that affect us personally. And that's good. It's all good. You remember the, the movie War Room? Uh, it was a big movie a couple years back. And, and it, was, it was a good concept that, that men and women need to have this war room where we are in our, our prayer closet every day. And, and we're praying for our own transformation, the transformation of you know, our family around us and and that movie showed the, the powerful effect of what a private prayer closet can do for your personal life and for your family life. But when we come together in corporate prayer, there's a whole different purpose for that. And the purpose for corporate prayer is that it builds the body to affect the region with kingdom culture. When we come to pray here on Wednesday nights, we get the word out. Because the only way to be one in our mind is to know what the will of God is. So we open the Bible and we begin to pray scriptures that tell us what? 
that tell us what the will of God is. And when we read the scripture, then we pray that scripture, because then if we pray scripture, we know for a fact we're praying the will of God. Right? It's a beautiful thing. It's one of the things that, you know, when, when, uh, when God began to change my heart when I was interim here, and I was telling you, I'm not going to put my name in, not going to do this. I know God's will for my life. I don't need you guys to be asking me every week because I know God's will. And uh, what I began to look at, what God uh, had done here in the past and was doing here, and realized that uh, one of the things that impressed me so much was just how you, how you guys pray in corporate prayer, and that it was always based upon the will and the word of God, and that we didn't get off into little tangents. We didn't talk about um, the deep things of scripture and what we disagree on. We came here, we read the word, we prayed the word, and then we released the word to work. And those kind of things just like, oh my gosh, that's so kingdom-minded. And those are the kind of things that God used to kind of change my mind and, and uh, make me see that I don't know everything and that it's good for me to be open and if it's good for me to be open, it's good for everybody to be open. And so sometimes we have to change our mindset. We have to change our hearts about things because um, if something's working, why fix it? I don't go out to my truck and open up the hood and take the alternator off and then put it back on just for the fun of it, right? No, if, the, if, if you start it up and... and the power keeps going while you're driving it, then the alternator works. You don't have to fix an alternator if the alternator's not broke. And this corporate prayer meeting is something that is being done according to the word of God and it's producing a oneness and it, it's not broke. And so there's no, there's no need to fix something that's not broke. It's a beautiful thing that happens here on Wednesday nights. And it happens in other places. Um, I, I, I'm getting, I constantly get calls from people. Hey, we're, we're gathering a bunch of people. We're going to be praying over here for, for this particular thing. And, uh, um, and so, you know, if, if, if it fits in the schedule and we're able to do it, or if it's something that's very important and we can change our schedule, we go do that. So corporate prayer doesn't just happen, you know, in your own church on a certain night. Corporate prayers also uh, are, are things that happen when, there's, uh, when someone calls for a prayer meeting, a corporate prayer meeting. But when we're in corporate prayer, it's not a time to build ourselves up. It's a time to build the body up, which is the exact, um, which is the premise for when we look at the gifts of the Spirit in, in 1 Corinthians 12, that those gifts, when we're in a service, the gifts are to be used to build up the body, not, not our own person. That's why it says that there shouldn't be tongues in a, a public service unless there's interpretation because tongues is a gift that builds up the believer. Prophecy is a gift that builds up the body. So Paul says, I'd rather you prophesy. And so the same thing is when we get together for corporate prayer, we're not, we're not there to build our individual selves up. Because what happens is if we get in a corporate prayer meeting and we're there to build our individual selves up, that's where pride can come up. That's where our own agenda can come in. And the corporate prayer meeting is not about our agenda. We just talked about that. It's about the will of God. So that's why we pray scripture, because we want to get rid of our agenda, and we just want to get on the agenda of the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in this region. So it says they were united with one mind. United means with one mind. Actually, it's a word called homothumadon. And when I saw that, I said, that sounds like a dinosaur. <laughs> And sadly, it is a dinosaur in the church today, isn't it? Is that, that, that being continually united in prayer, that's a dinosaur. Because we're, we, we all want to have our own agenda. We want to say, hey, would you pray for this? Hey, would you pray for that? When the corporate prayer meeting is supposed to be us coming together and praying what Holy Spirit leads us to pray. And we, we get that through the word. And then we get that through the confirmation when he speaks to us during the prayer meeting. And then finally it says they were continually united in prayer. Uh, prosuke 
is that word for in prayer, and it's prayer to God. And I've been in corporate prayer meetings before when I wasn't sure who people were praying to (laughs) because they were praying up their own agenda, and it seemed to me like they were praying to themselves or they were praying to, uh, to those of us in the circle. We're not here to pray to each other, and we're not here to pray to ourselves. We're here to pray to God. And I think that's a very important point. Corporate prayer requires uh, participation, interaction. Corporate prayer requires agreement in prayer. How can we agree in prayer if we don't know what we're to pray about? That's why we pray the will of God. That's why we pray the word of God. And so um, corporate prayer also requires us to pray his will and not our will. I, I can remember, and, and I am not making fun of anybody. I'm just telling you, um, I, I once knew this person, and uh, they would put out prayer requests, um, and the prayer request would say, pray for so-and-so. Uh, they're having a particular heart issue. And so what we need to pray is that God will actually go into the heart and go into the blood vessel and remove the calcification and do da 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 and this and that and the other. And <clears throat> their heart was good, but they were getting into the realm of praying their own will into something when all we needed to pray was, if we're going to pray for this person, we just pray, uh, kingdom of God come, will of God be. God, we just declare your healing over this person. Guide the doctor's hands, you know, the things that we pray. But, but to get into how exactly to pray it, we aren't here in corporate prayer to tell God how to do things. And sometimes our corporate prayers, um, not, not here, but sometimes our corporate prayers in the body of Christ are all about us getting our way in ministry or our way in this earth when the Bible says that God's ways are higher than our ways and that we aren't the ones that have all the answers. If you, were to, if you were to sit here and, and have a list of everything that everyone in this building right now has discerned about God over the last week, we probably would have about a 50-50 truth rate. Because we as a people, we don't always discern correctly, right? We have things within us. We have filters within us. We have sins and and, and issues within us that taint the way that we hear. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm teaching next weekend at a conference, and my topic is iniquity-based doctrine. It's when our issues and our sin form the doctrine and the theology we have about God. And how sadly the church today, uh, worldwide, has fallen into iniquity-based doctrine where we say, well, God's not really concerned with holiness He's all about grace, and so if you're sinning, no big deal. God's grace will cover all that. Really, because the Bible says, be ye holy, for I am holy. It doesn't say if you've got some sin issues, it's okay. We'll work through those over the next 40 or 50 years. Basically, the Bible says, you've been bought with a price. Stop sinning and start serving the Lord. (laughs) It doesn't say, it's okay, we'll get you through this. We'll give you 40, 50 years to rid yourself of all these demons. No, the Bible says, now that you know who Christ is, now that you know who you are in Christ, stop lying, stop cheating, stop stealing. Isn't that what it says? (laughs) And all of those things, lying, cheating, stealing, are not the result of our behavior. It's the result of the rebellion and iniquity in our heart. And when there's iniquity in our heart and there's rebellion in our heart, that's what creates sinful behavior. I I told you this a a few weeks ago. Um, When Adam and Eve were in the garden and the slimy serpent is is coming in and he goes, hey, doesn't that fruit look good? And they're like, oh, dude, it's untouchable. God said, don't eat it. Don't even touch it lest you should die. And the serpent says, you aren't going to die. You're not going to die. God knows the day you eat of it, you're going to be just as smart as he is. And so Eve looked at the fruit 
and she saw that it was good. That's where iniquity and sin came into the garden. It wasn't when she picked it and ate it. It's when she said, despite what God says, I've decided the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is not a bad thing. And when that happened, iniquity came into their hearts. And the picking of the fruit and the eating of the fruit was simply a behavioral result of rebellion that was already in them. So when we're talking about iniquity in someone's heart, and we're talking about the fact that sometimes we don't discern correctly, and sometimes we don't even pray correctly, it's because there still could be this iniquity in our heart. There still could be this rebellion that says, well, I love Jesus, but nobody's going to tell me what to do. And I'm just telling you, I've heard people say that. You're, you're, you're counseling someone and they, they've got tons of debt and they've got maybe addictions or, or whatever and they've got family problems because they're abusive. And you say, well, you know, here's what the Bible says. Don't be, don't be telling me that Bible stuff. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I live by the power of the Holy Spirit. He'll tell me what to do. And I'm like, how's that working for you? There's, there's, there's filters in us sometimes from this iniquity that make us think what we're doing is right, make us think what we're discerning is right, when actually it's the enemy's voice that's telling us what to do. Or sometimes it's just our own voice. You know, the worst, the, there's a worse thing than the devil being your Lord, and that's you being your Lord. And I know that doesn't sound right, but I'm telling you, when you let the devil be your Lord, pretty soon he makes you your own Lord because he knows he doesn't have to do near as much work. If he can just get you making your own decisions and not relying upon the Holy Spirit, he's got you. And he doesn't have to work very hard if you think you're Lord. And so that's just important to understand that. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, says this, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came a, from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. <clears throat> it says they were all together in one place. That word together is the word uh, home. Uo. It means at the same place at the same time. Corporate prayer requires us to be at the same place at the same time. If we want this corporate attitude, if we want to build oneness into our body, we have to be at the same place at the same time. What we've just experienced for many weeks was because of a virus, we didn't meet here. And I came on Wednesdays and we videoed the sermon and then we, we uh, debuted it on uh, Sundays and we all sat in our homes and we watched the service. And sometimes we even tried to do communion together. But you know what the biggest issue was? The biggest issue was we weren't really together. We weren't in the same place at the same time. We couldn't sense what God was saying and, and, and our discernment being able to be confirmed by the discernment of other people in the body because we weren't together. Now, we could, have, we could have typed some stuff on the screen and a lot of people would say hello and amen to that point or whatever, but we didn't see a whole lot of oneness come because guess what? We weren't in the same place at the same time. <clears throat> so the word together... The easiest way to explain what the word together means is it means together. <laughs> it doesn't mean separated. We did corporate prayer through a conference call for a while simply because we wanted to respect people's health and their concerns and all that stuff. And it was a little difficult because couldn't quite hear really well. Um, you know, you, it, it's, it really makes a difference when you're communicating. No matter whether you're communicating with people or you're communicating to God, it makes a huge difference if we're eye to eye, face to face. Because then we also see the body language. It's easier for me to understand 
when you talk to me, if I can see you, it's really hard for me uh, because I'm hard of hearing. I go into my pharmacy and so I say, hey, I need uh, my prescription refilled and they're behind glass with a mask on. I can't see their lips and I can't hear them very well. The, the, not only their mask is, is blocking the volume, but then the glass is. And so I'm sitting there going, what? What's that? Because <laughs> we aren't really together. We're, we're, we're separated by mask. We're separated by glass and all this stuff. And, and, and I get it. I understand that, you know, sometimes that's important. But the key to corporate prayer is that we're together. And the key to communication is not only just what we've said, but sometimes it's how we say it. It's the inflection. It's the tone. If you can see love on somebody's face, it'll change the whole inflection of what they've said. I once had a secretary. I was a worship leader at a church in Morrison, Illinois. And the secretary got upset about uh, something. She wasn't upset with me. She was upset about something that happened at the rehearsal. Now, she was my secretary at the church, so I really, the only time I really needed her there was on rehearsal night. That's when I needed copies made. That's when I needed her to distribute music to people and all that stuff. And she said, I'm going through some issues in my life and people are asking me questions and it's too hard, so I'm not gonna be coming to rehearsals anymore. I'll just make the copies the night before. I'll leave them on your desk. And, and I said, well, what, what happens when we need we decide to change the song on Thursday night for rehearsal and, and um, well, I don't know, but, and so the, the, the conversation didn't go well. We were talking by email. I don't know if I have, I don't even know if I had a smartphone. I don't know if it was by text. I think it may have been by email. And then at one point she even called me and was telling me this just isn't working well. I may have to quit. I said, well, let's don't, let's don't do that. Let's get together face to face. Nope, can't do that. Can't do that. You, you remind me of someone who hurt me when I was a kid. And when I'm with you, I think about that person, so I can't be with you. And she basically said, I don't want to quit, but I can't be at rehearsal, and I can't meet with you personally. And I said, then what are we talking about here? And she's like, well, I, I'll still do the job if I don't have to come to rehearsal and I don't have to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. I said... I don't, I don't know how you can be my personal assistant <laughs> and not come to the rehearsal and not talk to me face to face. I, I, don't, I don't think you're getting this. You're quitting. She goes, oh, I'm not quitting. If you fire me, that's fine, but I'm not going to quit. And I said, well, I, I don't want to do this over the phone. I, I want to see your face. I want to be able to talk to you and, and really hear your heart. And you can't do that through the phone. And it ended up that night, um, I don't know if she quit or I fired her, but we ended up dissolving the relationship. And I ended up becoming my own personal assistant for a while. The only good part is I had nobody else to blame when I made mistakes, when my assistant made mistakes. But the, the point is, is, that, is that coming together creates an atmosphere that is better for communication. It's better for relationship, it's better for understanding what's going on, for discerning what's going on in the spirit, because none of us know it all. That's why we need each other. That's why the body is supposed to be a corporate body. That's why we come here on Sunday mornings, because you can see my face. You can, hear, uh, you can hear a lot of what I say through the way that I say it, through my gestures through my bad jokes. You can blame my dad for that. He did all that to me. But anyway, um, in Acts chapter 3, another scripture, verses 1 through 8. Now, Peter and John were going up together to the temple complex at the hour of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. We, we talked about this two weeks ago. And a man who was lame from birth was carried there, placed there every day at the temple gate, called beautiful so he could beg from those entering the temple complex. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the complex, he asked for help. Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and said, look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. 
Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up, excuse me, <clears throat> started to walk, and he entered the temple complex with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. It says, now Peter and John were going up to the temple complex together. Two can be together. Four can be together. Forty can be together. Four thousand can be together. Four million can be together. Four billion can be together. I can't go any higher than that because I can't count the zeros. But four whatever the next, quadrillion can be together. Together. And here's what together brings into the life of a church and in the life of a believer. Because they were together, a miracle happened. A man who was lame 40 years began to walk, leap, and praise God. Together, we can do miracles. When we walk together in one accord, the culture will change. When they walked together into the temple complex and they met this man and they pronounced healing in the name of Jesus and the guy got up and walked, a little while later, Peter began to preach again and another 5,000 people were saved. Culture began to change. They began to see that this Jesus whom they killed a few weeks ago really was the Messiah when they began to do things together in his name and miracles began to happen, all of a sudden people's hearts changed and pretty soon the culture changed. What happened is they gave their hearts to Jesus, they came into the kingdom and they began to act in oneness. And you have Acts chapter 4 then where the church was together and they, they brought in their their money, they sold their lands and their houses, they brought in their money, they laid it at the apostles' feet, and there was no one in the body who had need. That's culture change. There was no longer poor people in the body of Christ. There were no longer hungry people in the body of Christ. There were no longer people who didn't own a four-wheel drive and couldn't help you move in the body of Christ because everybody just picked up a chair and walked it over to your next place. I don't know if that really happened, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what I'm saying is that things began to change, the culture began to change because people came into the kingdom and they began to work together. The third thing that happens from together is when we do things together, in the name of Jesus, in the kingdom, people come into the kingdom. People get saved. People come into the kingdom. When we work together, people see what the true church should look like and they go, that's what I want. You know, this whole thing, say a prayer at the end of a service, get your foot in the door of heaven, go on living like a sinner. People don't want that. But that's what we do as a church on the whole is we just say, oh, it's all about just get people to say a prayer. Prayer doesn't get you into the kingdom. Prayer doesn't get you saved. Repentance from your dead works and becoming alive to Christ Jesus, that's what gets you saved. Our repentance is what gets us saved. And, and culture changes when people begin to repent of their bad attitudes, repent of their false thinking, repent of their deceitful thinking, and they begin to turn away from sin. They begin to turn toward the Savior that's how culture changes. And that's what we're called to do as the church. Acts chapter 4. I think I already talked about this. Now the large group of those who believed were of one heart and one mind. And no one said that any of his possessions was his own, but instead they held everything in common. This is culture changing right here. And the apostles were giving testimony with great power to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus great grace was on all of them for there was not a needy person among them because all who owned lands and houses sold them brought the proceeds of the things that were sold 
laid them at the apostles' feet. This then was distributed for each person's basic needs, being together in the physical body and in the spirit produces a kingdom culture in whatever it touches. Now, when you hear the term prosperity, what is the first thing that comes into your mind? Probably a TV preacher who's selling you some snake oil or a cloth that he touched or whatever, and he's saying, if you do this, or if you give me this much money, God's going to bring you prosperity. Do you know how God brings prosperity in the body of Christ? Through oneness. Not through a television. Not through a promise by a guy who's sitting with millions of dollars in the bank. And some of those guys are doing great things for the kingdom. So some of the people that preach this prosperity gospel thing that, that is so iffy, they're still doing good things for the kingdom. But that's not the way prosperity is explained in the word. How prosperity happens is now the large group of those who believed were of one heart and of one mind, and no one said that any of his possessions was his own, but instead they held everything in common. I don't want to read the whole thing again, but it comes down to the community of God takes care of itself. So prosperity means no one in this community has needs. If you have a need, you speak to somebody and the church meets that need, the community meets that need. That can only happen if we are in a corporate culture where we're in community together, where we're, at the, where we're together in the same place at the same time. I can't know your needs if I don't know who you are, where you live, or I don't know what your needs are. The purpose of community is so that we become a corporate body so we can meet needs. And so here's what happens. Corporate prayer... Corporate prayer is where people come together to pray and they have one agenda, God's will. They have one voice because they've now become one in God's will. And they have one purpose, which is to perform God's will. That's being obedient to his voice. That's the purpose of corporate prayer. And what corporate prayer does is it changes the corporate body so that it affects the culture around us. And pretty soon, if we understand what corporate prayer is and we understand the purpose of it, and we understand that corporate prayer is what changes the culture around us, pretty soon we're out in culture and culture is changing because we've been praying the will of God and now we're doing the will of God as the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. So it's interesting. I didn't even think about the fact that this will be our first communion together, which is where we come together corporately to proclaim the death of Jesus and the resurrection and the forgiveness of sins. And so we're going to open up uh, for communion. And just remember, um, we'd appreciate it if you haven't recently